I'm just going to talk uh, very quickly, or just to sh very quickly show you some examples of um, buildings that have been reused uh, into mosques, uh, former religious buildings that have been reused into mosques. Obviously, um, a lot of issues have come up already this morning um, through the presentations looking at Buddhist and uh, uh, Sikh um, uh, and Hindu architecture, which already talks about the way in which existing buildings are reused uh, and, and which has described that process of moving from uh, small adaptations to uh, purpose-built buildings. Um, and that's, that's very similar, if not the same, for the trajectory of mosque architecture. So this isn't really the time for me to talk about the whole um, story, but really I'm just going to look at this one issue which is around uh, what we might call adaptive reuse and how do you deal with existing buildings which have a historic uh, character uh, and significance already. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you have to forgive me, I'm just going to change the order of my slides if you don't mind. Um, I see why the book took so, so, so long. But, um, so I'm just going to start with this, this example in... Um, Manchester, and really uh, it's just to again pick up on one of the points that was made earlier, which is about how the reuse of existing religious buildings or the continued religious use, though the faith changes, um, is a way of preserving the character of the building and of, of, of really sort of enabling that uh, building um, and its architecture to sort of continue in, in, in quite a sort of celebratory way. Uh, and this is a very good example. Um, Didsbury Mosque in Manchester, which is um, originally an 1873 uh, church, and it was acquired by a local uh, Arab Muslim community in the 70s, um, and it had a sort of rudiment rudimentary conversion uh, made to it, which is usually, in churches, it's usually a case of simply clearing the uh, floor plate, really, and, and creating a space uh, for congregational prayer, for Muslim prayer, which just needs a large open space in which it can take place and providing some kind of ablution facilities. Um, and then in 2011, it went through a, uh, a substantial sort of renovation and redevelopment. And this was the result after that. This was the uh, main prayer hall. Uh, and as you can see, the structure of the church has remained intact. Um, the, the, the roof structure and the timber beams and so on are all uh, in place and they've been sort of, they've been brought out in the refurbishment. Uh, and the hall, the uh, the hall has been created through the um, sort of clearing out, the laying of the carpet, and so on. And um, the other interesting, particularly interesting thing is this is the the mehrab on the left hand side, which is where the imam who leads the prayer uh, will stand. And uh, that's been placed into the sort of southeastern wall of the church, which I think is conveniently for this one. It meant that the prayer lines can all be sort of orthogonal uh, in the church, so it, it, it was a quite a convenient arrangement. And you can see the pulpit there uh, of the church has been reused as effectively the pulpit for the mosque. So it's a complete kind of reuse of the furniture as well uh, and enabling that to be um, retained. And the rose windows, you can see um, a lot of the kind of stained glasswork has been retained, uh, a lot of the leaded glass has been retained. And the, uh, the centerpiece has been replaced with the Arabic word for God. Um, so again, it's the kind of quite subtle and quite appropriate real uh, uh, kind of reusing of those facilities. And this is um, the second example I'm showing. So I'm going to show this show to three, three buildings. This is the second one. Uh, this is Brent. So this is a congregational church. It's a non-conformist church that was built in the early, um, early I think it was 19, 1910 this one was, was built. Uh, in two phases, there was, because the building actually spans between two streets. Um, there's Howard Road, there's Chichelle Road on this side, and then there's Howard Road on the other side, which is kind of one block behind. Uh, and the building spans between the two streets. The Howard Road side, there's a, uh, a school hall, which was the first part of the building, and then the church was built um, probably about 10 or 15 years after the school hall, hall by about 1910, uh, or 1902, sorry, it was built. Um, and what's interesting here is the way in which, when the Muslim community acquired the building in uh, 1980, uh, the adaptations that they made uh, to try and re-signify the religious purpose. And what you'll see in a lot of adaptations and, and conversions is the desire and the sort of need of communities to be able to signify the place uh, with its new religious function. So uh, you can see the sort of green, small green bones that have been placed on the building, one on the top of um, what was the kind of sp spire or steeple, if you like. Um, and one which is at the front there, which is again where the mehrab was built, which is where the imam would stand, and, th and that projected out 
uh, into the street, again to give as much floor space inside the building as possible. And you can see the sort of references for those dome elements which have come from this kind of uh, uh, period of sort of Mughal architecture in, in India. Uh, the Jamia Mosque in Delhi is, is just an example of that where you can start to see these really quite direct uh, associations between uh, architectural and historical um, styles. And that's again something that we see quite a lot of in uh, Muslim architecture, which is the replication and the reuse of uh, tr traditional Muslim uh, architecture uh, in different ways. And in, particularly in the early period, um, there was much more, th there was this kind of attempt to bring s elements over and adapt them onto existing buildings. Um, this is the Howard Road uh, side. So you can see that there's a porch, this is kind of entrance portico that's been built on the face of the school building. And uh, again, that's been sort of um, identified and signified with these, uh, with these kind of dome type uh, elements. And you can see the uh, significance and the importance for communities to create that signification or to reascribe a new language onto the uh, existing building. Um, in the interior of the, uh, of the mosque, this is the main hall. And uh, this whole kind of front, almost like a kind of neoclassical mehrab, which is the only, only sort of one that I've seen really in that kind of style. But it's, it's placed where, the, um, where you saw the photograph from the street in the, other, in the other photograph. So that kind of projection in the centre is, is, the, uh, is what was projecting on the front elevation. Uh, and the, the chandelier hanging uh, down the middle. And you can see that kind of hole in the ceiling. So what they were attempting to do was to put this, uh, some of this fabric ceiling up with a dome. So there was going to be, or maybe it was there, but it sort of came down, but a kind of dome within the space, again, to evoke uh, that traditional, uh, recognizable uh, Muslim language. Um, the dome, I, can't remember, I don't know whether they actually built or whether it came down, but you can see through the ceiling, or through that fabric, you can see the, uh, um, the original structure of the church. So the building itself, the fabric of the building itself, is more or less uh, intact. And this is the upper, upper gallery. Uh, again, you can see the structure is there, uh, the balcony, the, wood, the timber balconies and so on, has all been retained really uh, quite nicely. Uh, and the conversion can sort of happen within that existing um, framework. Now this one has an interesting um, story when you look through the planning files. This was a, uh, a, a pr proposed uh, redesign of the front of the church building by an architect called Latif Siwani. Um, now he was uh, an architect in Gibbard's, uh, Frederick Gibbard's office and he worked on the Regent's Park Mosque which was built by 1977. So he was in Gibbard's team working on the Regent's Park Mosque. And uh, the date of this one is, I can't quite exactly remember actually, but it would have been roughly contemporaneous with that, with that period. And probably early 80s was when this proposal um, would have been put forward to the planners. And uh, what's interesting is the way in which uh, what S Siwani was doing was trying to work within the existing uh, framework of the, um, of the, uh, of the building, uh, of the facade sort of decoration, and, and a apply a kind of an arabesque pattern work which would, which would sit within the existing elevation. This didn't, um, didn't come to pass. Um, I mean, there's notes in the planning files that say that the, the proposal didn't, that the community didn't manage to gain funding from the community to implement this proposal. So it didn't uh, actually happen. And there was another drawing that came after this, which was for a proposal for a complete uh, a re building of the church. There's a proposal to kind of demolish the existing church and rebuild a much more kind of traditional uh, sort of mosque with kind of minarets and domes. I mean, the, build, the, the drawings were very, um, very sort of sketchy, so they weren't very developed at all. Um, and um, I mean, I think luckily that didn't happen. But um, what was interesting was, what it suggested to me was the way in which this slightly more kind of nuanced or, or, or kind of complex response to working with existing uh, architecture and language was something which was a little bit, p possibly something which was a little bit more difficult for the local community, the local Muslim community to, um, to, to, to maybe to take on board uh, and to see as the next step for their building, whereas rather the, the, the sort of response was to create a new uh, building. But um, I guess for a number of reasons, practicalities probably, that the church actually functioned quite well uh, as a mosque. Uh, and there wouldn't really have been any great benefit in, in sort of knocking it down and rebuilding another one anyway. Um, probably those kind of reasons that the, mosque, that the church building actually uh, stayed and um, 
and they were able to convert it into the mosque. And I'm just going to go back now to the beginning. Uh, and I sort of want to show this one at the end, really, because, um, uh, because it's one of the most, uh, um, I don't know, sort of, I mean, it's quite a very famous example of uh, ad adaptive reuse of a religious building. And this is the Brick Lane, what is now the Brick Lane Mosque. Um, and it has a history which has really become emblematic of the kind of cultural layering that, that, that characterizes the East End uh, of London. Um, and, it has such co and it has a very complex uh, kind of series of uses that I can never remember exactly what they are. So I'm just going to quote from this rather lovely book that I have here. Uh, in front of me. Um, don't mind. So, um, yes, the building started in uh, 1743 as a Huguenot church. So it was built by the Huguenots who were settling in, in this part of Spitalfields. Um, they had to petition the king at the time uh, uh, to get permission to build it. Permission was given, and then they were able to build uh, this building, uh, which is built in a very sort of, um, uh, um, uh, a sort of, you know, a, a, a kind of um, straight, very straightforward style. There was nothing in there that necessarily uh, um, pronounced it as being a sort of church or a human nature. So it was very much fitting into the environment, fitting into its neighbourhood uh, at the time. And it was followed... Um, in 1809, so it's about sort of 60 years that it lasted as a Huguenot uh, church, and then it became it was taken over by an organisation which was called the uh, the Society for the Propagation of Christianity amongst the Jews, which is a great great name. <laughs> but um, it's also a very interesting um, uh, idea because this is basically the Jewish community was at that point uh, growing, and it, this did become a very sort of densely packed uh, Jewish neighbourhood uh, around that period, sort of through the early uh, 19th and through the through the 19th century. And uh, so it became a, a, this Christian missionary uh, organisation. And then uh, that lasted only for about 10 years. 1819 it became a Wesleyan Methodist chapel, so it went back to a Christian use. Um, and then uh, that went on until the end of the century, so 1898, it then became a synagogue. Um, and uh, uh, and the, the synagogue use carried on for the next uh, 76 years, or 78 years. And in 1976 it was purchased by... Uh, local Bangladeshi uh, Muslims who uh, turned it into the Brick Lane Mosque, which is what, what, it, what it is now. Now, over that whole period, the building didn't really, um, in terms, certainly in terms of its exterior fabric and in terms of its, its, its um, external appearance, it didn't really change. And um, this is a drawing of the interior of the church when it was a, a Methodist chapel. Um, and this drawing dates from 1743. I'm not sure exactly. This was this dates from about 1819, this drawing. Um, so it's kind of the only one that I found which, which depicts it as a Methodist chapel. Um, and then this one, a uh, photograph of the synagogue in 1951. So you can see that the actual fabric of the building, the positions of the windows and so on, um, have remained uh, intact. And it's really the interior uh, features and furniture and so on which has been uh, replaced in, in both of those cases. Um, it's probably, I'm not sure if we know exactly what, the, what, what it was like when it was a Huguenot uh, church, but this is again a photograph of it in its, uh, uh, its use as a synagogue. You see the gallery on the upper floor and the um, <coughs> columns and timber work, which you'll see in the current use as well. Uh, and these floor plans, uh, which were produced for the, well, the English Heritage, Religion and Place in, in Tower Hamlet's project, I think they were produced right for that uh, at the time, show the, again, the changing of the interior layout within the existing fabric of the building, or the, within the existing shell of the building. And the lower plan shows it in its um, <coughs> mosque use, um, which is, again, where all the interior furniture really has been taken out to create large open uh, prayer halls. Uh, and there is still a gallery in it. So this is the current building uh, now. And what you can see is uh, this is the ground floor <coughs> prayer hall. Uh, and the, the, the timber panelling that, that you saw in the photographs for the uh, upper, upper galleries when it was a syn synagogue uh, has been reused to create this kind of panelling um, for the upper floor. Uh, and you can see the columns as well have also been uh, retained and reused. And the door cases and door sets and so on uh, are, are also uh, original and retained. And this is the upper floor prayer hall, which, which was the upper floor gallery. So is that continuing uh, changing of the in interior? Um, on the roof uh, of the building, uh, uh, there was an addition which was built, uh, I think it was early, nine, early 20th century, when, while it was a synagogue, where the synagogue built a number of classrooms 
for uh, religious education for Jewish children. Um, so there's a kind of timber addition on the roof uh, which was built at that time. Uh, and this is a photograph of that sort of top floor. And you can see the, the, the window at the end, which is a window that you see in the gable uh, of the front facade of the building. And again, this, is, this is, has been re re retained uh, and reused for um, classrooms in which uh, the mosque can, can also sort of carry out religious education for uh, children, sort of after school classes and so on. Um, so it's, it's, it's ha it has a very kind of um, easily reusable uh, and sort of adaptable um, set of functions already. And this was um, a new ablution facility which was built on the uh, exterior face of the building, um, on the sort of rear, as it were. Uh, and this was uh, obviously granted listed building consent. Um, I think it was around 2007 or 8, I can't remember exactly, um, that these works took place. And there were sort of other refurbishment works in the building that were carried out then as well. But it was, a, it was an overall um, sort of application to adapt and modify the building. Uh, and then I think it's quite a good way of um, uh, building onto the side of the historic building in a way where you can, al where you can also um, sort of uh, have an understanding of the fabric of the original structure, which is obvious, obviously the, the, the sort of the intention of um, sort of listed building, um, well, you know better, but the kind of one of the aims of kind of listed building uh, consent is that you can, you can understand the history and the fabric of the existing building, and this one works quite well, while bringing in uh, really a new uh, function for the new religious use uh, of the building. The other um, sort of large, kind of significant element that was added to the building uh, was the minaret. Now, um, it's a, this mosque has over the years looked at different ways of being able to create a, a symbol or a, uh, uh, on, on the building that denotes it, denotes its Muslim use. Now, as we saw in Brent, um, that desire or that requirement to denote a building with a new identity uh, and with a new um, sort of religious function is a very strong uh, uh, desire within communities that use the building. It's quite an important thing for communities to, communities to be able to do to feel that they have ownership and also to feel that they can communicate their uh, presence and their use uh, within the wider uh, community. So there were other uh, proposals or uh, attempts to create minarets on this building over the years, but they were all unsuccessful because attaching to the existing building was just not, not something that was going to be permitted, considering its, its listed status um, and its historic character uh, and the way in which it sits within the townscape and so on and so on. All of those kind of quite normal uh, planning and listed building issues. Um, eventually, there was a. Uh, they did manage to um, to succeed with an application with a proposal, um, because there was a series of works going on on Brick Lane, which were to do with uh, enhancing the uh, uh, the kind of townscape. Uh, and there were a number of um, sort of street furniture elements that were being built. There was signage. There was a kind of gateway over the beginning of Brick Lane, and these were all to do with re-signifying the street and the area as uh, what, what has come to be known as Banglatown, um, and it was about sort of a, a kind of celebrating or identifying the area with its, uh, connecting it with its Bangladeshi um, heritage. Um, so the minaret proposal fell into the overall schema of these works, which was about the signification uh, of the area and its Bengali heritage uh, on the street, as it were. So the minaret was eventually um, approved and built, as you can see here. Uh, and it was designed by a firm, DJ Architects, and they designed it in such a way, oh, it's on the cover, it's actually, if you haven't twigged, it's actually on the cover of the book as well. Um, but it was designed uh, as a series of kind of like these steel, stainless steel drums with arabesque patterning on it, uh, with a sort of tall spire and, and this crescent. So it was part, in a way, it's part street, for, it's part kind of street sculpture and part minaret, so it sort of sits between these two uh, um, sort of realms of being something that signifies that this building is the mosque, but also being something that signifies that this area has a particular sort of cultural landscape uh, and so on. And you see it here in, in the evening, so it has kind of different colored lights in it, which actually, it does look good, actually, I have to say. Um, but you can see that, uh, you can just might see in this photograph that it sits slightly away from the building. So I think this is also a quite an important point is that the minaret is not attached to the building at all, but it does sit within the, within the um, sort of street space. Um, so again, its kind of physical positioning puts it in this uh, kind of dual zone of being both a signifier for the mosque, but also being a signifier um, for the area. So, it's, so it, has, it takes up this slightly 
um, uh, kind of negotiated position. And uh, there's an interesting planning uh, condition on the planning permission um, that, <coughs> that came with this minaret. So when it was granted planning permission, there's a condition that says that when the building, uh, when this building is no longer to be used as a mosque, uh, the minaret has to be taken down. So it has a sort of conditional, <laughs> I don't know how, I'm sure that's not going to happen. But it's one of those conditions. Is that is that enforceable? I mean, I have to, you know, defer, right there. Yeah. So, but it's interesting that that was the sort of um, legislative uh, framework within which this particular piece of kind of architectural symbolism was understood. Was that well, it can be there as long as the mosque is there. But once the mosque is there, then its use so it has no longer gone. I'm sure it will still be there because I think it will just become part of the part of the street streetscape. And I'll finish there. Thank you.